Hello, I'm Father Louis Skurdy, and I welcome you to Friends of the Word, the Weekday Word. Today we have some intrigue in the, in the Holy Scriptures. The conflict between Saul and David comes to a head, and of course in the, in the Gospel, Jesus chooses you as one of the Apostles. Let's go to the Friends of the Word, Gospel and Homily, and pass this on to your family and friends. Thank you. Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Alleluia. 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 The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus went up the mountain and summoned those whom he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, whom he also called apostles, that they might be with him, and he might send them forth to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, whom he named Peter, James, son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, whom he named Bogaris, that is, son of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes you can read the Gospels, not the Gospels, anything in the Bible, for um, reflection, for peace of mind, for uh, ease, to relax yourself, uh, to put yourself in God's presence. But if you open up some of the books in the Bible, eeks, bloodshed, threats, guns, fires, you know, everything going on, and, and... A lot of that stuff is in the family of Jesus. So you think you have a dysfunctional family. Jesus coined it. I mean, really. David, son of, I mean, this is going to be David, the great king, who's a direct ancestor to the lineage of Jesus. And we hear him today facing Saul. He was, he was compassionate today, but David's a little on the shady side. He had affairs, he, he sent uh, one of his generals to fight so he could have a, an affair with the general's wife, he marries the wife, he peeks on another woman, taking a bath, and there's other stuff going on. Um, not to emulate, but to realize that when the scriptures are put together, they're to, put together authentically to give a perfect reflection of the writer's theme. Okay? Now, this is referred to as the book of Samuel, one of the prophets, trying to give an overview of the life of especially King Saul and David. Now, of course, that has nothing to do with the gospel, but it does have something to do with the gospel because the gospel pictures Jesus calling his, his apostles. And we hear the characteristics or the, the surnames of some of them, but the last apostle he calls, Judas, betrays him. So even his own inner circle, not, not only his family, his inner circle is a little shaky. And of course, we know Peter, the, the big mouth of the apostles, I'll be with you, no one's going to happen, nothing's going to happen to you, you're not going to wash my feet, all those wonderful things. I don't know the man. Jesus, never met him. Runs away. Denies him. So, Again, if you think you have dysfunction in your family and with your friends, relax. Put yourself at ease. Put yourself in the presence of God. Because reading the scriptures should give us peace of mind. Even though it's got stories like this of intrigue in the Old Testament, in the book of Sam, first book of Samuel, or in, in the Gospels as we hear the intrigue around some of the apostles and the rejection of Jesus and the denial of Jesus, that should give us pause. Because don't forget, Jesus became a human being to show us how to live. 
to show us that life is not going to be a bowl of cherries, that life's not going to be easy, but life is always to be focused on him. He is the eternal one. His example of life, death, and resurrection is our invitation as to how to live life. So relax, you have it tough. Relax, you're in good company. And we can look to Jesus, and also we can look to David, and we can look to Saul, and we can look to all the characters of, of, of the Old Testament. Now you realize something very beautiful happens today between Saul and David, and, and Saul has, he's hiding, David comes with his army. Saul, I, as I mentioned before, uh, we think was depressed. Okay, He was a, probably, de they used to call it melancholic. Um, he's a, probably a manic depressive. His characteristics show that. A little paranoid. Uh, David, his, his uh, psalmist, his assistant, grows up to be a man, of course. And while he's growing up, he starts doubting David's fidelity to him as, as, a, a, as a member of his staff. And, of course, eventually people speak into his ears, as you have people speaking into your ears, and we believe the gossip. And he believed the gossip that David was out to kill him. So he flees, David catches him, and he's sleeping. He goes into the cave where Saul is sleeping and cuts a little bit of his, of his robe just to let him know, eventually he does, that he was there. That with the same sword, he could have cut off his head or stabbed Saul, but he doesn't. Out of fidelity to the role of Saul as, as the king, because he's still king, and he calls him his father, his mentor, and because it would be unjust. There was no reason to kill him. Saul was after him, but there was no reason for David to kill him. But he had the opportunity. And he tells Saul, I had the opportunity to kill you, I didn't. Here's a piece of your, your mantle to prove how close I was to you. And that's a lesson for us. Understanding patience, forgiveness, avoiding uh, grudges that, that bring us to, to real disaster sometimes, avoiding getting even. You know, who, who's, who profits when we harbor hate in our souls toward another person? Who profits from it? We hurt. We don't like that person. If, if it's a relative, maybe we don't hate him or her, but we're maybe envious, maybe we're angry, maybe um, we don't like the way he treated us or, or what she said, and, and we keep it in, we keep it in. And even if we gossip about it to other relatives, who's hurting? You're hurting. The person who's doing the, the dirt, the person who's expressing the anger hurts. So we have, one, and, and people will hurt us, yes. Our goal as Christians is Jesus. Forgive, we never forget. We're not, we're, we're not simpletons, we can't forget. But we forgive. In other words, the first step toward forgiveness might be not getting even, not gossiping about it, not doing something back to him or her. David had a perfect opportunity to lop off Saul's head. He didn't. You want to look at the scriptures for reflection and peace of mind? Go to the intrigue. Go to, go to the violence. Go to the forgiveness. Go to the reality of Jesus, who even on the cross said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And my last word might, has to be on January 22nd for the many, many, many children who were aborted. I, I, I have to go to the mothers of those children I, I have to think of the, the, the conflict and, and uh, confusion in their hearts and souls. And even those who are so flippant about, uh, and, and there are people, women, who are flippant about abortion as a, a kind of uh, birth control because they are a little um, loose in their morals and their lives. And having an abortion is nothing. Even the conflict in their minds, the confusion in their hearts 
to believe that they can use their bodies that way. And you know, adults know as we look back, they'll pay with confusion, with heartbreak, with, with, with torment. They'll, they'll pay, regrettably. And, and we don't wish them evil. We have to always pray for them. And, and the conflict that goes on between young people who, who practice early premarital sex and the conflict that happens when the girl has to call the guy and say, I miss my period. I might have a baby. I, it, it has never happened in my family. I pray God it never does. But if it did, did happen in any of our families, we have to be compassionate to those girls and those young, young boys. Not encourage death and, and abortions. But if they've chosen that beyond our control, we have to forgive them and love them. They're broken. What do you do with broken people? You hold them and you pray with them. You don't condemn them. Oh, they do crazy things in Washington, I know, and, and, and hang out ugly pictures of premature babies or pictures of, of embryos. That's nuts. That's nuts. We know what we're doing when we're protesting. We don't have to make it disgusting. We have to make it wholesome. So I'm not condemning them either, but just saying, I don't march. I don't do those things. I don't go there. But I do pray for them, for the marchers, the protesters, for the Supreme Court, and for the many, many young women and men who have made the choice. We pray for their lives and the future lives of our country. Thank you.